back in the late 50s, early 60s, a man decided to start a church, plant a church. And we're all about that here at Linwood. We, many years ago, planted Fruitland Community Church. We are in the process of helping plant one here in our area. Uh, probably in the last month, I've heard of three different pastors who are starting churches in Cape Girardeau, other than the ones I've described. Uh, so I don't know about what it is out here, but people like to plant churches in our area. But we believe in that. In, in Belarus, we're planting about 20, 25 churches, helping there. And so it's a very worthy thing. But this was planted by a church, some of you may recall, by the man named Jim Jones. Jim was a very charismatic leader. Uh, Jim uh, really went into it with ulterior motives. He began in Indiana, Indianapolis, and the church began to grow. That his church was uh, focused on a certain type of gospel, which consisted of communism, socialism, and politics. Uh, we would describe this. Others outside the church would look at it and say, well, it's a kind of a social gospel where he's attempting to meet the needs of those who are underprivileged and trying to lift them up. Well, there was very little Jesus in that gospel message. But the church grew, and people really followed him and, and uh, politicians, uh, movie actors and actresses, and all the rest really got tied into him. And he was very influential, particularly when in 1970 he moved the church to California, and uh, actually in 69. And then in 1970, he believed that the church should move, it's called the People's Temple, by the way, should move to Jonestown, Guyana. He named the town after himself, which ought to be a clue. And uh, so uh, he, he moved them there. There were some folks who had, in this period of time, had defected out of the church, primarily when they were in California. And there was a documentary that I watched about this. Uh, I was about 11 years old when all this went down. I remember some parts of it. But uh, uh, I watched a documentary some time ago in Hugh Fortson, who was a former member of the church, quoted Jim Jones. Now, here's what he said. What you need to believe in is what you can see. If you need to see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. If you need to see me as your father, I'll be father for those of you who don't have a father. If you see me as your savior, I'll be your savior. If you see me as your God, I'll be your God. Now, we always read that and, and listen to that and say, that's crazy. But by this time, he had three to 5,000 members at this church who followed him. While in Jonestown, reports began to come out that he was abusive physically, immorally. He was an immoral man. He was abusive spiritually. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a bad leader in every sense of the word. So much so that Leo Ryan, a United States congressman in California, flew down to Jonestown, Guyana on November 17, 1978 to, to get firsthand reports of the abuse that was taking place. On the next day, November 18th, he made his way to the tarmac to get on the plane to go home. And while he was there, there were several individuals, members of the church, who wanted to defect they wanted to get on the plane. It was a very chaotic scene. Jim Jones heard about this, and he sent his security troops out to the tarmac and opened fire on those who were at the plane. The congressman was murdered as well as three journalists and one of the defectors. Well, obviously, he knew that things were going down. So that, that evening, the next day, actually, on, on the following day, he got everybody together. There were actually uh, 919 people living in Guyana. He still had uh, part of his ministry in California, but he's in Guyana. And he says, all right, he said, this is what's happened. And I, as your leader, believe that we need to end this today. Ending it meant that they all committed suicide, 919 of them, 276 children, Believed this man to the point that they would kill themselves for him. How did they die? He took Kool-Aid and laced it with cyanide. They drank the Kool-Aid. Whenever you hear that sentence, 
oh, that guy drank the Kool-Aid, or that group drank the Kool-Aid. That's where it started in 1978. Now, how in God's name is it possible for somebody to follow a leader like that? Three to 5,000 of them. Well, I'm going to explain to you exactly how it happens from God's Word. If you will, open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to begin in verse 18. For those who are guests, we're going through a study of the book of 1 John, and so uh, this is where we are as far as going through the text. One of the reasons why I like preaching through a book of the Bible is it forces you to deal with every passage, you know, if you have integrity. And so this is an interesting passage today, and it really fits and answers this whole issue of, of deception. And it's very relevant for our time today. So uh, let's follow along in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Here's what he says. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. We know from this that it is the last hour. <clears throat> they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar, if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? He is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son can have the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. What you have heard from me from the beginning must remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He Himself made to us eternal life. I have written these things to you about those who were trying to deceive you. The anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it is taught you, remain in him. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. All right, now there are four sections to this passage, and I'm only going to deal with the first two today, so it's a two part sermon. Uh, but yet, we're going to look at the whole passage as a whole over these two weeks. The four sections I want you to notice the first one begins in verse 18, where he uses the word children. The second one begins in verse 20, where he says, You. In verse 24, he starts out by saying, You. And the last section is verse 27 when he talks about you. Now all four of these sections are dealing with the anointing or the message of Jesus Christ. And so the theme of the passage as we see here is the power of deception. That's what was happening within the churches there. I want to ask you a question as we go through the message today and I'll basically end with this same question. Are you sure that what you are thinking, saying, and doing is of God? Or are you deceived? Do you really know? Can you be confident that what you are thinking, saying, and doing is of God? Or are you deceived? It's easy to be deceived. But the truth is God's given you the resources that you need to discern the truth and to answer that question. Notice first of all we live in an age of deception. We live in an age of deception. He says in verse 18, children, it is the last hour. The word children there is referencing the body of Christ. The members of these churches today would represent all of us who are in Christ. Now the last hour obviously is referring to something that is eschatological. That means something that is happening in the end times. Well, what is that last hour? What is it? What does that mean? Well, it is now. He says, present tense, it is the last hour. Now, what do we know by that? Well, the Bible teaches us as a whole, particularly the New Testament, that the last hour, the end times, the latter days, 
refer to the period of time between the death and resurrection of Christ, which defeated Satan, and the second coming of Christ. We don't know when that's going to happen, but that's the period of the last hour, the end times. We're in this last hour. And John says it is the last hour, and the proof of that is that there is an antichrist who is coming, and there are antichrists, plural, that already exist. Well, then who is the antichrist? And who are these antichrists? Well, the word anti, anti, means against. Uh, so it, it, he's saying that the antichrist is, here, uh, is coming, the antichrists are coming, are already here. Therefore, Christ has already come. How can they be anti anything that hasn't already happened or existed? So Jesus has already come. He's proving that the Messiah in particular has already come and they are against the Messiah. It's a proof of their faith. So anytime that you're feeling persecution for your faith, you're feeling ostracized, you're feeling that, that things are happening in your life because you're a follower of Christ, then it's a fulfillment of what John is saying that you possess Christ, that he's a reality in your life and there are those uh, these antichrists that are coming against you. So, okay, so who is the antichrist? Uh, that word is only used by John, by the Apostle John. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul describes this same person as the man of lawlessness or the son of destruction. Now, what was going on in Thessalonica, the church there? They had believed that the rapture had already happened. Uh, they believed that Christ had come and that they missed it and they're very discouraged. And he's helping them understand that no, that has not happened yet. When I was in college, we uh, had Dr. John Davidson. You know the actor, John Davidson? This is his uncle. Uh, i show my age here. Uh, John Davidson, uh, he was a professor in New Testament. And uh, we had the class president in my class. There were about 100 students in this class. Well, he was really the class clown. And he decided that we should all go to the basement and that he wrote on the board, the, the rapture has happened, you've been left behind. So, uh, big joke. So we all come up and uh, Dr. Davidson said, well, I'm glad to see you all back. He said, yeah, the rapture did happen and uh, you got left behind because I handed out a test and you all got a zero on it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't happy that day because of Jack Chambers. Uh, who led us into that uh, zero. But, but he's saying you've missed it. Well, no, they hadn't missed it. He's saying here's what's going to happen. He said there's going to be a rebellion. There's going to be a leader of that rebellion. And that, in that sense, the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And he is going to put himself above God. And he's going to sit on the seat in the temple. He's going to sit in the temple. Now, we also find that the leader of the rebellion is Satan's puppet, that he's the persecutor of the church. And in the book of Revelation, he's described as the beast who is the leader of the ten nations who are against the Messiah, against Christ. So that's the Antichrist. More about that later. The Antichrist, plural, are false teachers, and they're also against Christ. They emphasize the divinity of Christ and not the humanity Others of these antichrists will deny the humanity of Christ and only emphasize the deity of Christ. Some theological uh, issues or positions are open for debate. Some are non-negotiable, and this is one of them. That you cannot deny or change the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is non-negotiable. In no way can you compromise on who he is and what he did on the cross and in his resurrection. He says that's paramount above all. And that's the real root of the argument that he's addressing here. Now, later we're going to study in chapter 4, verse 3, he says there's a spirit of Antichrist. Now, that's been with us ever since Genesis chapter 3. And we're still dealing with that spirit of Antichrist. Well, John is encouraging the church. He's saying all of these attacks against you, against the church, against Christ, proves that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has come. Why would they be so upset if he wasn't here? They know he's here, and they're coming against him. Now notice verse 19. They went out from us, 
but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belong to us. He's saying that this age of deception is going to lead others astray. They're going to lead them away from the church. We talk about the perseverance of the, of the saints. And he's saying here that, that those who, who are truly the saved, those who are saints, those who, and we say that word, not that they're perfect, but that's the description of the believer in Christ, saints of God, then they, they, they persevere. They're the ones who are still with us. Those who left were not true believers. He says they went out so that. Well, God is revealing part of his plan of who are true believers and who are not. They left so we would know who are the true believers and who are not. Notice also in this one verse, he uses the word they five times and he uses the word us five times. Now, that's a very distinctive mark here of showing that there's a group that is true and there is a group that is not and he says you need to go with the goers you need to go with the goers you need to go with those who are true believers not these false teachers this verse also answers the question about a person who's prayed to receive Christ but then at some point in the journey no longer follow Christ what does he say here they were never part of us they were pretending to be Christians but they were not true believers they didn't actually have faith in Christ in a very sincere, legitimate, secure way. If they had, they would not have left. Or if they leave, they return. Now what's the summary here of what he's saying? There are leaders of deception. There are a lot of Jim Jones out there trying to lead God's people away. There are antichrists. There is one, he describes it as one, who eventually will become and be the leader of all of this. But there are many antichrists who are already here doing this. There are followers of deception, listen, even in the church. He's writing to Christians, alleged Christians, who were in the church, active in the church, but they had been deceived. And also, he says, there is a spirit of deception, the spirit of antichrist, who was Satan. Paul would say it like this to a young pastor, Timothy. Now, the spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, this period that we've described, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. Now notice what he's saying. He's saying that Satan works through liars. Demonic teaching works through, it comes to us through those who appear to be right, who appear to be Christian, but they are liars, they are hypocrites. It's not like a demon is standing up and you can look at it and see it's a demon and it's talking to you. He's saying it is a demon and it's demonic teaching and the source is Satan. You can't see it physically, but you're seeing it through a physical person who's describing himself as a true prophet, a true teacher of faith. Very, very uh, prominent and very relevant for today. They lived in an age of deception. We live in an age of deception. But here's the good news. The second section of this passage is that we possess God's truth. He's encouraging them with these words in light of the fact that they are in this age of deception. So this point and the next two points next Sunday are all about what's, what's good. And, and, and the power that you have to overcome the power of deception. So he begins by saying, we possess God's truth. They, he says he's encouraging them because they are anointed. They are anointed. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. There's two things he's saying. You have this anointing, and you have knowledge. Now, the word anointing here is rarely used in the Scripture, but it's used here. In the Old Testament individuals would anoint somebody else with olive oil to set them aside or set something aside as sacred, something that is set apart for a holy purpose. Then we see later on that that olive oil was used as a ritual to anoint somebody who would rule or somebody who would prophesy. So it would be a king or a prophet who would be anointed physically. 
So you had this physical anointing on someone for a set-apart purpose, but that's not what he's describing here. He's not describing a ritual of being anointed with oil like that. That the anointing is the Holy Spirit. A person has received the Holy Spirit, and that happens at conversion. That that anointing comes on you. That the anointing of Christ is on you through the Holy Spirit. So we are anointed when we receive the Spirit. All right. Now, notice he says, this comes from the Holy One. Now, is that God or Jesus? Nowhere in the Bible is God described as the Holy One, quote unquote. He's described as holy, but not that title, Holy One. In the New Testament, we find, or in the Old Testament, we find that the Messiah is described as the Holy One of Israel. In the New Testament, we see several passages that Jesus is the Holy One of God, and twice He is titled the Holy One. So what's happening here? That God gives us the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. When you confess faith in Christ, you receive this anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's when that happens. But notice he also says that you have possession of the truth. He doesn't need to write to them because they don't know the truth, he says here. He says you already have it, but you need to apply the truth. You need to understand it and apply it in the context of deception. They have God's Spirit. You have that anointing and you have the Word of God and that truth in order to deal with this lie and detect a lie. This is, knowledge is not just intellectual. It's a relationship with God through Christ. Uh, it's between God and man. It's transformational. It's dynamic. It's life-changing. In verse 22, John states that the false teachers and those who have left the church are liars because they do not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They're lying about what is true, and John hits this head on. Notice verse 22. He is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son can have the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. You can't have one without the other. The two go together. The early Christian community confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ, fully man, is the Son of God, fully God. Now, in 100 A.D., Serenthus, he was uh, a Gnostic Jewish Christian from Egypt. I say pick one and go with it, but he, 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 he was a Gnostic. He was a heretic, and here's what he said. That at the baptism of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the, that, that word means anointed. We, we translate it holy one. It means anointed. But the, the, the Christ, the Messiah, came upon Jesus in the form of a dove at the point of his baptism. Now, if you listen carefully, there are those today who will still say that. And then at the crucifixion, the Christ, the Messiah, left to be back with God. And so Jesus was nothing more than a mere man. There, there was no fusion of God, Jesus being fully God and fully man. And in essence, what they're saying is that there is no incarnation. That God did not come and dwell with us in the flesh as we would know it. Fully God and fully man. Well, in every century, in every age, you've had those who refuse to acknowledge the Christ of the Scripture. Some deny the virgin birth. Some deny uh, the ascension. Some deny the resurrection. Some deny the bodily uh, return of Christ. Some deny His divinity. Some deny His humanity. But anyone who rejects the biblical teaching of Christ, John says, that person is a liar. So heads up, you need to be listening carefully. One writer says this, For John, the height of heresy is to deny that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and Savior. To, redu to reduce Jesus to the status of a mere man or to allow no more than a temporary indwelling of some divine power in him is to strike at the root of Christianity. That's why why John's saying you can't have one without the other. If you have the Son, you have the Father. If you have the Father, you have the Son. The two go together. So here's the point. You possess God's truth. You possess God's Spirit. You have everything that you need to discern what is right and what is wrong. Now that's affirmed in the Heidelberg Catechism. There are two questions that I want to point out. There are many questions in the Catechism. 
But I want to I to let you listen to question 31 and 32 and the answers. Here's the question. 31, why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? You see, the anointed one has anointed you. That, that's, that's the key. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Answer, because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance, our only high priest, who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body, and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us. Now listen, in the freedom he has won for us. Well, that's a great line. That he keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. We were bound to sin and to bondage and to enemy, to the enemy, to Satan and his kingdom, his domain of darkness, his deceit and his lies. But he has freed us from that and keeps us in that freedom. Here's question 32. But why are you called a Christian? Answer, because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to do what? To confess his name. To present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks. To strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life. And afterward to reign with Christ over all creation and for all eternity. All right. Now John's addressing a church there that is being deceived. Now how does that, what does that mean to us? All right. Well I'm going to give you some deceptive statements that I often hear. I wrote these down. Here's some deceptive statements that I often hear and their response. Number one, the Bible was only written by man. Well, that's true or not true. The Bible was written by man. Well, the Bible was written, as we understand, by God. God is the author. And the Word of God is inspired by God. So he inspired, and that means God breathed uh, into men. They were, the Bible says they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that every word that we have comes from God. God used human authors, human writers, but God's the author ultimately of the scripture. Here's a second deceptive statement. Parts of the Bible were written for a past culture. It's not for our culture today. Have you heard that one? That's very popular today. All right. Well, here's the truth. All of the Bible was written for a past culture. There is truth to that. Meaning that every page of the Word of God was written for a certain audience back then. John's writing to the church in Asia Minor. Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. He wrote to the church at Rome. You know, all the rest. These are for uh, 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 a specific audience. So what they don't say though, what they don't mean, what we mean, when we say that the Bible was written in a past culture, it means that there are commands, there are truths of God, there are principles, there are applications that transcend all culture for all time. And so yes, there was a certain audience back then, but we have to cross a bridge to today. And so how does the Bible speak to us in light of what he was saying back then where it is still true today? Here's another deceptive statement. We should focus on loving everyone. You hear that? We should focus on loving everyone. Interpreted means we should condone sin and tolerate sin. Let them live the lifestyle they want to live. We should love everyone. Very deceptive. What exactly does a person mean when they say we should love everyone? All right. Well, here's another one. The last one I'll use for this. God loves everyone. Well, sure. All of us would say that. Interpreted, what they mean is everybody's going to heaven when it's all over. He loves everyone. Well, no, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says God loves everyone, but it doesn't say that everybody's going to heaven. Only those who are in Christ. Only those who are in Christ are going to heaven. Otherwise, the cross makes no sense. What are some signs of deception? How do you know that you're being deceived? I'm going to speak of that in two ways, as a group and then individually. As a group, a group that calls itself Christian but deviates in its theology and practice from the biblical teaching of those doctrines is a false group. We call that a cult. That's what a cult is. 
that they, they, they believe things that are contrary to traditional Christianity. Another sign is that there's a single charismatic leader who has authority. And he possessed that authority as the founder. And listen, there are successors from him who hold that final authority. It's a human being who has the final authority. All right? We believe that God is the final authority. And the Bible has our authority as interpreted by Jesus Christ. He's the commentary on the Bible. More to say about that, I don't have time. Another sign of deception is there's acceptance of new or additional material. They'll say, uh, we have new revelation that we've added to the scripture. Whenever you hear that, you run. You don't want to have anything to do with anybody who says, well, there's been new revelation. There's new revelation. Especially when they say, God's given me a word. Well, you've got to be real careful about that. When I say, God's given me a word, that means I've been impressed by my spirit I sense that God is leading me to do this Uh, I've never heard God audibly but I have a strong sense there's a confirmation in my spirit that bears witness with his spirit about what I ought to do and the step that I'm taking but when 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 somebody says well God's given me a word it's a new revelation no that's deception also if, if there's a belief that that group is the only church or religious organization, then you need to run from that. Don't listen to them. Now, sometimes I, I've had them say that to me, and every now and then, if I have time, I'll say, well, you will say, well, uh, you, you know, because they'll say, we're the one, the one true church. And I'll say, well, you know, about a year ago, uh, God told me that I was supposed to start a church, and, and I'm the one true church. And they say, well, no, we're the one true church. I say, well, how, how do you know that? I mean, the same God who told you that is telling me that. Which means you're not a true church. And by the way, mine's not a true church. So it doesn't make any sense. But when they say they're the only church or only religious organization, that's deception. Christ is the only way. He's the one. The church of Jesus Christ. Uh, or if they change theology or redefine certain terms, that's deception. Okay, So we've got to be careful about those outside traditional Christianity. Now, what about personal deception? Here are some signs that you're in danger of being deceived. Now, these are very important, all right, because this is where we really live. Number one, you begin to doubt God's word. I know it says this, but is that really true? When you begin to doubt God's word, uh, then, then you're in danger. Secondly, when you begin to pull away, I've watched so many times. There are people who pull away and stop. You, you know, they, they're not going to join a cult. They're not going to go follow a, a, a teacher that is a heretic. But, but they begin to pull away. I know something's going on spiritually. But there are those who who begin to pull away from their friends, from the church, because they are listening to somebody who's deceiving them. And and it's contrary to what they have known. So that's a sign of personal deception, that there's a pulling away. Here's another deception, personally, feelings over facts. Feelings over truth. I know the Bible says this, but I feel that God means this. Then you're in danger. When you begin to feel something other than what the facts say from God's word, then you're in danger of personal deception. Or someone other than Jesus brings greater satisfaction in your life. Someone or something else that brings greater satisfaction in your life. Believe me, you are being deceived and you're headed for a great fall. Because that is going to prove itself to not satisfy you. And it could be disastrous in your experience of faith if that's where you're going. Now, here's the good news, finally. God's given you tools to discern deception. Number one, you have over 2,000 years of Christian orthodoxy. Most of the church has believed Christians, true believers, over the centuries, have a history written and recorded of what we have believed that is called orthodoxy. And, and, and we hold to that. So you have a history of what is truth. Secondly, 
as we find here in this passage of Scripture, you possess the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God is going to guide you into all truth. So if you're truly committed to seeking God and His will, the Spirit's going to be faithful to you. You have the anointing of the Spirit of God, and that Spirit's going to bear witness to your spirit about what is true. So seek the Spirit of God. But also, John says, you have all knowledge. You have the Word of God. Jesus said in John 17, your Word is truth. You have that truth. So I want to end asking you what I asked you at the beginning. Is what you're thinking, saying, and doing consistent with the Word of God, with these tools I've described, or are you being deceived? God, God is, this, is this right? And am I doing something that violates the Word, your Word, your truth? And, and, and look, ask the question. And God, He's not trying to mess with you. He's not trying to play games. He'll be faithful. Now, there's somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned because in this age of deception, I, I don't believe I have that anointing of God in my life. And I don't have uh, the Word of God. I don't have the knowledge of the Word of God because I don't know Him. You see, if you don't know God, then the Word isn't going to make sense to you. You need the Spirit to bear witness to what the Word of God is saying to you. And so today, God is speaking to your heart. He's pulling you to begin a relationship with Him so you can receive Him, His Spirit, into your heart. That's what we mean by the anointing of the Spirit. It's not some mystical, crazy, wild thing. It's just the Spirit of God coming as you, 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 you as Gabe said, we, we, we hold our hands and surrender to Him. Lord, I've come to the end of myself. I surrender it all to you. Then you can do that in just a few moments. But there might be many in this room that, that you need to ask yourself, and you know. See, anytime there's sin in our life, we've been deceived by the enemy. A any sin. It, 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 it's, it's proof that we've been deceived. So why not today confess that as sin, repent of that sin, and follow Christ. Ask him to help you overcome that sin that is holding you back. Others might be, God may be leading you to become part of our fellowship. Look, if you're here, we're going to try to help you know the truth. And we're going to support each other in living out that truth. There might be others that need to come and pray quietly before the Lord at the altar. Maybe you want someone to pray for you. You have a specific need in your life. We want to help you. So let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is truth. That Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And that we are able to be anointed with that same spirit of Christ so that we can know the truth so that we will not be deceived by the liar, the father of lies, the enemy. God, we face this every day. Every single person, every believer, every day. We know that, as John has already said, how we face the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so, Father, help us to live in that truth, apply the truth, and, Lord, that we'll be able to be used by you to help others experience the freedom that you can give from the deception that they're living in right now. Father, now I pray you'll help these who need to come. In Jesus' name, amen.